let's talk about the cardiovascular system. The name of the game here is circulation. The cardiovascular system circulates all of the things that the rest of the body needs to operate efficiently. That's nutrients, carbs, proteins, fats, oxygen, metabolic waste, hormones, immune cells, and many more. So what these have in common is these are all things that are dealt with by the other organ systems of the body. Nutrients are dealt with primarily by the gastrointestinal tract, oxygen by the lungs, metabolic waste, both nitrogenous waste and CO2 by the lungs and the kidney, uh, hormones by the endocrine system, and obviously immune cells by the immune system. So these are all the things that make the other systems of the body run. Uh, and, and the cardiovascular system is simply connecting them together so the body can run as one efficient unit. However, when we're talking about the cardiovascular system, we're not talking about what circulates, we're talking about how it circulates. Uh, so for this lecture, we'll start with the vascular anatomy and physiology, we'll talk about circulation and microcirculation, uh, and then we'll move to the heart and discuss the cardiac anatomy and physiology, both electrical and mechanical. So the first thing to understand in vascular anatomy is the basic circuitry of the body. And to start with, I think it's important to conceptually separate the right side of the heart from the left side of the heart. So the heart is one organ, it's, it's one thing, uh, but in reality it's made up of two separate pumps that serve interrelated but different functions. So the left side of the heart serves the function of pumping blood to the body or to the systemic circulation. It delivers oxygenated blood to the body and then blood from the body comes back and drains into the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart then pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs, the pulmonary circulation, where it is oxygenated and then returns to the left side of the heart. If you're looking for a little more uh, detailed drawing, this is essentially saying the same thing. Uh, let me remind you that arteries are defined by going away from the heart, whereas veins are defined by moving toward the heart. It has nothing to do with oxygenation. Uh, so for example, deoxygenated blood leaving the right heart will be traveling through the pulmonary artery. It'll make it to the lungs, it'll pick up oxygen, and oxygenated blood traveling back toward the left heart will be carried in the pulmonary vein. Okay, toward versus away has nothing to do with oxygenation. The next step is to compare the vessels themselves. So we can start by looking at a comparison of the vessels in cross section. From left to right, we have the aorta, artery, arteriole, which make up the arterial side of the circulation, capillaries, which perfuse the tissues, and then the venous side of the circulation, which is made up by venules, veins, and the vena cava before draining back into the right side of the heart. So what I want you to notice here is that the aorta is the largest of the arteries, and it gets smaller as it goes artery, arterial, and eventually capillary. And then the opposite is true on the venous side, venule, vein, and vena cava. Uh, I've also drawn in the walls of the arteries, which are relatively thick and muscular, uh, compared to the single-celled wall of the capillary, and the thin but somewhat muscular walls of the veins. What we need to keep in mind in, in all of biology is that structure will match function. So we, we look at the structure of the cross-section of the artery and we have to think about how this correlates to the function. So again, arteries have relatively muscular walls because they play an active role in circulation. We'll talk more about that in a bit, but suffice it to say now that blood vessels are not pipes. It's easy to make the analogy of the pump and the pipes, but blood vessels are anything but pipes. They are dynamic, and they have an active role in controlling the dynamics of circulation. As we see, capillaries are very small with single-cell squamous endothelial walls. Again, structure matches function. This is designed to allow for efficient exchange of gases and solutes. Veins are large vessels with relatively thin walls, and they're built for high capacitance. Capacitance is how much blood they can hold at any one time. And indeed, at, at any time in the body, most of the blood is on the venous side of the circulation. 
This will all be important as we move through this lecture. So again, this is the relative cross-sectional area of each of the different vessels. And this is one thing to consider, but we also need to consider the relative numbers of each of these different types of vessels. So if there's one aorta, there's many arteries, many more arterioles, millions upon millions of capillaries. Remember, the capillaries are perfusing every organ, every tissue. They're supplying the nutrients to the tissue and they're picking up waste. So there are millions upon millions of capillaries. They drain into venules, of which there are very many, which drain into the many veins, which drain into the two vena cavae, superior and inferior, and then back to the heart. So individual cross-sectional area only tells part of the story. If we multiply the individual cross-sectional area by the number of each set of vessels, we get a much different story. So now we're looking at the total cross-sectional area. Again, the aorta is very large, but there's only one. So relative to the rest of the circulation, there's not a lot of cross-sectional area. Whereas individually, the capillaries are incredibly small. But since there are millions upon millions, together, in sum, they have an enormous cross-sectional area. So using that information and the additional information I've given you on the left side of the screen, uh, take a moment, pause, and answer this question. The velocity of blood will be greatest when traveling through which of the following vessels? So the velocity of blood will be greatest when traveling through the aorta. So again, I've given you some information here. And with the information I've given you, you should be able to answer this question. Velocity equals flow divided by cross-sectional area. Okay, that's a simple equation from fluid dynamics and physics, um, and it relates well to the bloodstream. Uh, again, we've gone over the individual cross-sectional areas of each of the vessels. This would be the arterial side, aorta, arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. And we've gone over the total cross-sectional area. Again, this would be the arterial side leading up to the capillaries. So the question is, we're looking for velocity. Uh, flow can be held constant, uh, but we need to know which cross-sectional area is more important to use in this equation. Uh, so let's think about that for a moment. So in sequence, all of the blood traveling into the aorta must then travel into the arteries. And all of that blood must then travel into the arterioles, and all of that blood must then travel into the capillaries. Since there is a constant flow of fluid, uh, we can say that the total flow as it traverses each of these sets of vessels will also be constant. So holding flow constant, as I've done over here, I've added to this graph, we can then infer that velocity, that is the velocity of the blood, will be inversely proportional to the total cross-sectional area. Velocity multiplied by total cross-sectional area must sum together to equal flow, which is given in units of volume per time. So the aorta is large, but there's only one of them. Uh, so it must have relatively fast moving blood to have a high flow. Whereas when we get to the capillaries, since there are so many and the total cross-sectional area is so large, that the blood in each of the individual capillaries is actually moving quite slowly while still equating to the same level of flow. That would be the, the physics and uh, mathematical way to answer this question, but it should also make intuitive sense based on the function of each of these vessels. So if we think about it, the function of capillaries is gas and solute exchange. This occurs by diffusion, and this is not an instantaneous process. We may think of it as a very quick process, but it is not instantaneous, and it does take time to occur. So with that said, as blood is traversing the capillaries, we want it to be moving rather slowly to have efficient exchange of material between the blood and the tissues. That makes sense. The aorta is primarily designed just to carry blood from the heart as it is approaching uh, the next vessels in series. Uh, so it is a transport vessel and it, it can have relatively fast moving blood to account for that. 
So now that we've discussed the vessels themselves, let's dive a little bit deeper into the physiology of the circulatory system. So if you're still paying attention at this point, and you look very closely, you may notice that this is a physics equation. Yes, indeed, this is Ohm's law. And if you haven't studied physics yet, Ohm's law states that a voltage drop, or a change in voltage, equals current, I, times resistance, R. And then this would be a basic circuit, where you have a battery with positive and negative terminal providing a voltage difference. You have current flowing from high voltage to low voltage through a resistor and back to the negative terminal of the battery. And you may be wondering what this is doing in a biology lecture, but as it turns out, we are studying circuits. We're just studying a different type of circuit. So the circuit of the body is the cardiovascular system. Again, and if we make an application from Ohm's law, instead of a voltage drop, we have a pressure drop, where fluids flow from high to low pressure. Instead of current, we have the flow of fluids, which would be cardiac output. And instead of a resistor, we have the sum of all of the resistance of the vessels throughout the body, which we call the systemic vascular resistance. Again, instead of a battery, we have a pump. I've labeled it L here because we're primarily talking about the left side of the heart, which is why we have systemic vascular resistance rather than pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, but understand that the, these same principles apply uh, to the right side of the heart as well. Blood leaving the heart is, uh, has relatively high pressure. It flows through the body and returns uh, with relatively low pressure as it goes through the venous system. So this is a very important equation, and now let's focus on some application of the equation. So here I'm giving you a little bit of additional information on the left side of your screen. This is the average blood pressure as blood moves through the different parts of the arterial circulation. Okay, Blood, or any fluid, flows from high to low pressure. So we start with a high pressure in the large arteries, and pressure decreases as we move through the small arteries, the arterioles, and eventually to the capillaries. So take a moment, pause, and answer. Resistance is greatest across which of the following sets of vessels? So resistance will be greatest across the arterioles. These are the resistance vessels of the body. And if you haven't studied this, I wouldn't expect you to know it, but given the applications of Ohm's law that we just went over and this additional information that I've given you, you should be able to make this inference. So again, delta P, or pressure drop, is equal to the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. Okay. If we hold cardiac output constant, we'll see that change in pressure is directly proportional to resistance. And what I've given you on the left side of the screen here is the change in pressure as blood moves throughout the circulatory system. So as it moves through the large arteries, there's a relatively small change in pressure. Same with the small, uh, small arteries. Uh, but there's a, a very large change in pressure as blood moves through the arterioles. The reason for this is that they have a high resistance. And that correlates to the pressure drop. And then again, small as we go through the capillaries. Uh, again, that's the, the physics and the mathematical approach to this question. Uh, but it does serve a function. So the muscular walled arterioles act as resistance vessels to reduce blood pressure before the blood reaches the fragile thin walled capillaries. You don't want high pressure blood going into the fragile capillaries because they'll rupture. Uh, so the arterioles can help serve to uh, decrease the pressure of that blood before it gets to those vessels. Arterioles can also vary the resistance of uh, individual sets of vessels rather easily, which allows blood to be shunted toward or away from any particular capillary bed. Uh, for example, if you're exercising, uh, the arterioles in the gastrointestinal system will increase their resistance in order to shunt blood away from them to the uh, arterioles and capillaries of the muscular system. And the opposite would be true uh, when you're eating at rest. The body has the ability to shunt blood towards the area of physical physiologic need.
Alright, so let's try another question. A normal systemic blood pressure is between 90 and 120 millimeters mercury uh, and 60 to 80 millimeters mercury diastolic. Uh, and, and this is held in a relatively stable range and deviating from this range can have negative consequences on the human body. Hypotension leads to poor organ perfusion and shock. Hypertension leads to vascular damage which increases risk for stroke, heart attack, kidney disease, uh, and many other adverse health effects. Uh, so again, take a moment, pause, answer. Which of the following homeostatic mechanisms would be expected to occur in response to hypotension or low blood pressure? I'm asking you about changes in blood pressure, and the only variable I'm giving you is uh, systemic vascular resistance. So I want to know if it'll increase, decrease, or stay the same. So resistance would be expected to increase in response to hypotension. Remember, a homeostatic mechanism uh, will attempt to return the body to its baseline state. Uh, so if blood pressure deviates from the normal range and becomes too low, the homeostatic mechanism would be expected to raise it back to the physiologic set point. Again, all we're doing is using the formula that we just learned. Uh, pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Uh, so if we want to increase pressure, we have two options. We can increase cardiac output or we can increase systemic vascular resistance. So at this point, you may be wondering, if we don't have enough pressure to properly perfuse our organs, why in the world would we increase resistance? That would only make it more difficult for blood to enter those organs. So a good question, an interesting thought, uh, but we do need to keep in mind that pressure is the variable in this system that must be maintained at all cost. Pressure is what allows organs to be perfused. And although we increase the total systemic vascular resistance in order to maintain blood pressure, the body does so in a carefully calculated way. By constricting the appropriate vessels, we shunt blood to the organs that need it the most. For example, a patient in hypotensive shock would shunt blood away from the distal extremities. That's why their hands and their feet would be cold and clammy. They would shunt blood away from the gut uh, because they don't need to be eating and digesting any nutrients at that point. They would shunt blood toward the brain and the absolutely vital organs that need blood in that moment. So yes, increasing resistance can decrease perfusion to certain organs, but overall it's necessary in order to keep blood pressure at an appropriate level. So anyway, there are two options to do that. As we see here, increasing cardiac output or increasing systemic vascular resistance. Now let's discuss how the body does that. We'll start with resistance. And to understand resistance, we need to understand Pocell's equation. So you don't necessarily need to memorize this, but you should be able to understand how these variables relate to each other. So R, resistance, equals eight, eta L, eta is viscosity, L is length, divided by pi R to the fourth, where R is radius. So by far, the most important variable to understand in this equation, or the most important proportionality to understand, is that resistance is inversely proportional to radius to the fourth power. And this becomes a very classic test question. You have two blood vessels. Uh, they start out with equal radius, but say one has been affected by atherosclerosis, and there's a large plaque accumulating within it and it ends up reducing the radius of the vessel uh, by one half. So the new radius is R divided by two. And the question goes something like this. How do the resistance of each vessel now compare? So if we start with a resistance of R and we cut the radius by two, remember inversely proportional to the fourth power, the new resistance would be 16 R. That's one half to the negative fourth power or two to the fourth power. Okay, two to the fourth is 16. So just by cutting the diameter or the radius of an artery in half, uh, 
we've increased the resistance 16-fold. And this is why atherosclerosis is such a dangerous disease and why it leads to things like heart attack, stroke, and uh, vascular disease in general. So keep this relationship in mind. This is uh, the most important physiologic and pathologic way uh, that resistance throughout the body is altered. Okay, so blood pressure homeostasis. First of all, how does the body sense the blood pressure? Well, the simplest and the fastest mechanism is through baroreceptors, uh, baro being the root for pressure, so pressure-sensitive receptors within the aortic arch and the carotid bifurcation. They're able to sense changes in pressure, and then uh, through a negative feedback mechanism, the body can then adjust the pressure. So again, the most powerful way to adjust blood pressure would be through systemic vascular resistance, and the most powerful way to adjust resistance would be through the radius of the arteries. So physiologically, this is done through the sympathetic nervous system, which vasoconstricts. Pharmacologically, we can also do this, uh, again, with vasoconstriction uh, through drugs like norepinephrine, which is the same that the sympathetic nervous uh, system would use. What this does is it constricts blood vessels, increases resistance, and then increases blood pressure. But the opposite is also true. We could use vasodilating mechanisms to decrease radius, excuse me, decrease resistance, and decrease blood pressure. But again, there are two ways to increase blood pressure. If we go by our application of Ohm's law, you can increase resistance or you can increase cardiac output. And cardiac output is the heart rate multiplied by the stroke volume, which is the amount of blood uh, pumped with each beat. So again, there's physiologic mechanisms to control the cardiac output, uh, one of which, again, being the sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous activity is said to be positively chronotropic, which means it increases the heart rate, and positively inotropic, which means it increases the force of contraction and therefore the stroke volume. Both of those act to increase cardiac output. Sympathetic nervous system also constricts the veins, which remember most of the blood in the body at any given point is held in the veins. So if we constrict the veins, it'll actually send more blood back to the right side of the heart uh, which we call an increase in preload, which will then lead to an increase in stroke volume. The parasympathetic nervous system has the opposite effect and is negatively chronotropic and slows down the heart rate. If the body senses that the blood pressure is too high and the overall fluid volume is too high, it will also increase the urinary output, which we call diuresis, which decreases the effective blood volume and therefore decreases the cardiac output. All of this can be done pharmacologically as well. If we have a hypotensive patient, we can give IV fluids and blood products. Uh, if we have a hypertensive patient, we can give diuretics. And we can also give a, a variety of positive and negative chronotropic and inotropic agents. So that was the big picture view of circulatory physiology. Now let's turn to the microcirculation. Uh, and looking at the microcirculation will allow us to figure out uh, what actually happens to all of these materials once they reach their target destination. But again, it's not about what, it's about how. So let's talk about the physiology. First, let's review capillaries. Capillaries being uh, very thin-walled, a single cell layer of endothelium separating them uh, from their targets, allows for simple diffusion either across or between the capillary walls. So understanding some of the basic concepts of chemistry and biochemistry, we can infer that lipid-soluble solutes and gases will diffuse across the endothelial cell membranes, whereas aqueous or water-soluble material will not be able to diffuse across the membrane, but rather will have to pass through uh, little holes and crevices uh, between the endothelial membranes. Also keep in mind that gases will travel down a partial pressure gradient whereas solutes will travel down a concentration gradient. And water will travel through osmosis down its own concentration gradient. So we have here uh, a capillary uh, carrying blood, uh, the interstitium, and the target cells and tissues. Uh, so remember that simple diffusion is occurring across the walls of the capillary. Uh, but the, the sophisticated mechanisms of transport, including channels and transporters are primarily located on the target cells and the tissues themselves. 
uh, which the material will interact with after it tra traverses the capillary wall and the interstitial fluid. So there are many different types of capillaries, but in order to allow for effective exchange of fluids and solutes, they all must be somewhat leaky. So we need to talk about fluid exchange. And to talk about that, we're going to talk about the Starling forces. So not necessarily an equation that needs to be memorized, but one that should be intuitively understood. I've written it as a proportionality. Um, I've left out the constants, uh, but this is the important part of the equation. J, or the fluid flux out of the capillaries, being a positive value, is proportional to the difference in pressure between the capillaries and the interstitium. That would be the hydrostatic pressure, P, minus the difference in the oncotic pressure between the capillaries and the interstitium. So let's talk about this. Hydrostatic pressure, P, is the one that intuitively makes the most sense. If there's a lot of pressure from the fluid pushing out on the capillary walls, uh, some of it will leak through into the interstitium, and this will travel down the pressure gradient. The oncotic pressure is similar to osmotic pressure uh, in that it will draw water to areas of high solute concentration. However, it's slightly different. In this case, we call it oncotic pressure uh, when we refer to the proteins that are held within the bloodstream. So most of the small solute can freely diffuse across the capillary wall. So it doesn't contribute to the oncotic pressure because it will equilibrate between the capillary and the interstitium. However, proteins in general are too large to travel across the capillary wall and will then be held within the capillary itself. Because of this, as fluid leaves the capillary and leaves protein behind, the overall solute concentration of the capillary will exceed the solute concentration of the interstitium. And we call this oncotic pressure, which is denoted here as pi. It's negative in this equation because uh, it's somewhat of a, a sucking force, whereas pressure is more of a pushing force. So the, the leftover protein will act as a, a suction force to suck water back into the capillary from the interstitium. The sum of all of these gives us J, which is the flux. So let's try to understand this as we move along the blood vessel. So starting in the capillary where most of the exchange is taking place, we have higher pressure within the capillary than we have in the interstitium, which causes fluid to flow out of the capillary. Initially, we have higher oncotic pressure within the capillary relative to the interstitium, but it's a, a relatively small difference. So the net effect would be positive flux out of the capillary. As this fluid leaves the capillary and we move toward the post-capillary venule, the pressure within the capillary decreases a little bit, uh, but it's still more than the pressure within the interstitial space. However, because fluid has started leaving the capillary, but protein has stayed, the oncotic pressure within the, within the blood vessel now increases enough to draw back in some of the fluid. So now the balance of forces shifts in the other direction, and there is negative flux, or fluid flowing back in to the postcapillary venule. And that brings us to the concept of lymphatics. Uh, so we've been talking about capillaries and we've been talking about blood vessels, but in understanding the startling forces and fluid exchange that's occurring at the capillary uh, and postcapillary level, if we take into account that more fluid flows out of the capillary then flows back in, that is filtration or the outward flux exceeds absorption or the inward flux, we need to understand that over time, fluid will accumulate. If this happens, we have what's called edema or swelling, uh, but the body has a way to counteract this. Because there is slightly more filtration than absorption, uh, lymphatic vessels will actually take up this excess fluid and return it to the circulation via lymphatic vessels, which drain into the thoracic duct, which drains into the left subclavian vein, and goes back to the heart 
to take part in circulation once more. The lymphatics also have other functions, um, primarily immune functions, which we'll discuss in other lectures. Uh, but first, let's apply some of this information. So in patients with heart failure, they're unable to maintain an adequate forward flow of blood, and they're unable to maintain an adequate cardiac output. And because of this, the excess volume in the circulation backs up into the venous system. Okay. Blood will back up before the broken pump. And when this happens, it leads to edema or swelling. So taking into account what we've just learned, take a moment, pause, and answer, which of the following variables is most significantly affected by heart failure, leading to edema? So the answer is A, the capillary hydrostatic pressure. So remember, as we're saying here, blood is moving through the vessels. But in heart failure, the, the heart can't properly deal with the venous blood, and you get a backup before the broken pump. So you get a little bit of venous stasis, or static blood, that's pushing back against the blood trying to push forward. When this happens, this pressure is transmitted to the walls of the capillary, and overall, the hydrostatic pressure within the capillary increases. And this drastic increase in uh, hydrostatic pressure within the capillary causes a drastic increase in the fluid flux out of the capillary into the interstitium. Normally, this is overcome by the colloid uh, osmotic pressure or the oncotic pressure drawing fluid back in, but in the case of heart failure, uh, there's not enough oncotic pressure to counteract this force. And even on the postcapillary venule side, we might get a little bit of positive flux, um, leading to, in total, a, a very significant outward flux of fluid from the capillaries into the interstitium. Uh, so much so that it overwhelms the capabilities of the, the lymphatic system to return this blood back to the circulation, and the result is edema or swelling. So this is why uh, you see patients with heart failure, they'll have swollen or puffy ankles uh, because gravity will draw some of that extra fluid down to their ankles. Uh, that would be in the systemic circulation, but this can also happen in the lungs. So remember, if the left side of the heart is broken, blood will back up before the broken pump, which would be in the pulmonary veins. And when blood packs up into the pulmonary veins, these same mechanics happen within the capillaries and the postcapillary venules of the lungs. So now we have excess fluid on the lungs, which we call pulmonary edema, which leads to issues with breathing and oxygen exchange. That would be one case of uh, edema. Another case would be that in severely protein deficient diets, which we call kwashiorkor malnutrition, uh, you also get edema. In this case, it's a different reason. So remember, there are two variables we're taking into consideration, the hydrostatic pressure and the oncotic pressure. Now, the oncotic pressure is developed by the proteins that stay within uh, the vessels. But in severely protein-deficient diets, as sometimes happens in third world countries, there aren't enough proteins within the vasculature to provide enough oncotic pressure to draw fluid back in. So essentially, without these proteins, we have severely decreased oncotic pressure, uh, and in which case we have severely decreased absorption at the side of the postcapillary venule. This allows excess fluid to accumulate in the interstitium, overwhelming, overwhelming the lymphatics, and again leading to edema. So in this patient we see in the abdomen there's what we call ascites, which is excess fluid, and then at the ankles and the feet we can also see they're a bit puffy from some of the excess fluid. Uh, despite the fact that this patient is severely malnourished. So those were the basics of the vascular side of cardiovascular physiology. Uh, next we'll turn to the cardiac side and we'll understand a little bit of the anatomy and physiology of the heart.